My name is Don Merrill and I was a resident of Lawndale from about 1931 to 1944 and, uh, and we moved out. First question is how uh, how long have you lived in Lockdale? We, <laughs> we got that okay. Um, um, how did the area to be known as Lawndale come into being? That I don't know. Uh, it was Lawndale when we got here. Actually, my folks first came here in 1915, and they had a place on uh, Inglewood Avenue by where the railroad tracks are. Uh, is by uh, what is it? Um, can't think of the name of the street there, Manhattan Beach Boulevard, and uh, they were there they just recently married, and they had a new baby, and and uh, they used to have hobos that would stop by, and one night my dad worked nights, and my mother was there alone, and uh, being pestered by hobos, and one night there was a bum that was very very persistent, so she sick the dog on him. And uh, a couple of days later, my dog had been poisoned, so they got the message and decided to move, and they did. And then they moved out, and then they came back in 1931. That's I was born in 1928. So. Okay. Uh, um, what was the land like back then? Oh, gee, it was nice. A lot of eucalyptus trees. I remember as a kid that. You'd walk around many, many trees, and uh, most of the eucalyptus trees, strangely, would have swings, uh, ropes hanging down from them, either a tire connected so you could swing on it, or just a, a rope that you could jump, hold on to, and, and swing, and there's a lot of those. It was, it was very nice. Um, our first house, the one we moved into in 1931, um, it was on the corner of 147th and what is now large. And uh, it had a small grove of walnut trees. And I remember as a little kid going out and look at those. And I can remember, um, I was about, what, three years old. And I'd walk from there, my older brother and sisters were going to Losing Her High. And I'd, I'd walk, uh, it was a path that went from that place on over to Losing Her. And I'd go over there and, and uh, you know, wait for them and so on. So it, it was very nice. Okay. What were the people like back in those days? Nice, much nice. People generally were nicer. Uh, it was uh, not crowded. There was a lot of room. People were hurting. It was depression time. And uh, a lot of people were just, just didn't have any money, no jobs and so on. But a lot of them were uh, raising livestock and so they had small little farms that they in the back of their house and so forth they raise a few few vegetables and so on or raise some chickens and whatnot but the people were very very nice and uh, very helpful good people okay. um, there probably there probably wasn't a whole lot of like you know roads like there are you know these days but can you talk a little bit about <clears throat> the the roads and the infrastructure, uh, the way it was laid out back in those days? Yeah, actually, it's, it seems pretty much the same to me, except like 149th didn't cut across what is the bridle path or the dividing line of Hawthorne Avenue. Um, but uh, the, the roads seem to be just about the same as they were. I don't see a whole lot of difference there. They're nicer now. Uh, I remember there's a lot of flooding we used to take rafts and go down Hawthorne Boulevard and get on a raft. My brother got off the streetcar in Hawthorne and he swam down Hawthorne Boulevard one time. Was, the, the flood waters were so high. And uh, it was not uncommon then for a lot of flooding. So uh, as far as flood control, that's a lot better. Streets are about the same. They're bigger. It seems like Hawthorne is bigger. And there, there was a... Um, a bridle path or a divider between Hawthorne Avenue and a big ditch part of the way. And there was a um, riding stable over here by Rosecrans and uh, Inglewood Avenue. And you could rent a horse there, and a lot of people rent horses, and you take them, and then you go down Hawthorne Boulevard and go out towards uh, Redonda Beach Boulevard and just ride your horse down the middle of Hawthorne there on the, on the bridle path. But uh, 
about the same infrastructure. I don't see it, it's more crowded now. Um, the lots are smaller. We we had uh, houses on Hawthorne Boulevard and and um, on Larch. And the houses were they extended um, about halfway to the next block. And now I see they they put a lot more homes in there. So it's a lot more crowded now. Uh, much more space then. So how deep would those floodwaters get? <laughs> Pretty deep. Uh, I, 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 in spots, I guess, up to three, four feet anyhow. And uh, they didn't, I don't know why they didn't extend into the, in, into the homes. I guess in some cases they did. But um, it, it did get up there pretty high. This wasn't Lawndale, but in, um, oh gosh, on Sepulveda near um, Jefferson, they used to get floods in there, and they had tanker trucks that would st get stalled out, and the water would be, it would be up to the level of the, where the uh, cab was, where the driver up to where his window was. And that's pretty high, that's probably over six feet. But they got that fixed now too, but that, that wasn't Lawndale, that was, I don't know what, Culver City. But, How often did it actually flood? Um, it wasn't infrequent. It wasn't, you know, every time. But I, I would guess, you know, every couple of winters anyhow, we'd have a good rainstorm. And it just didn't have a good runoff. The water just, we'd have kind of a clay soil. And the water just no place to go. They didn't have any wet, uh, flood channels. So it just laid out there. It was fun. <laughs> yeah, you get rafts. And kid, yeah, kids get rafts, and we'd float around, and, and it was a lot of fun. All right. So, um, <clears throat> um, keeping along the same lines as Hawthorne Boulevard, um, they they had the bridle path down there for a while. There was the ditch. Right. And uh, eventually they. I guess they filled it in. Or, or yeah. Why, I, why did they do that, and what was it for? I don't know. I don't know, because I think we'd left here by the time they did that. Um, the ditch ran... Actually, the, the, well, I guess it went down, because I remember jumping across it, and we lived on 149th at the time in Hawthorne. And I remember jumping, so it was it was down that far anyhow. But I don't know when they when they filled it in. Could, could you park in that area back in the day? Or? Parts of it could. My brother, who's 13 years older than I am, and uh, he told me that when he was a kid, that he would, if you wanted to meet somebody or you know, you want to just hang out and talk, whatever, you could park your jalopy up on uh, Hawthorne and 149th, 147th, um, and just wait, and somebody would come along, and they'd park too, and you know, go ahead and talk, or take off and do something. It's kind of a meeting place. Oh, okay. Um, what was Lawndale like growing up? Uh, you know, what did, what did kids do for fun? Oh God, so many things. Um, we had well, they had the Japanese truck farms, and they had irrigation reservoirs that they'd built. I guess they were most built them themselves. But they ran along, I don't know, there were probably three or four of them. They ran along uh, Prairie Avenue between Rosecrans and um, Manhattan Beach Boulevard. And we'd go swimming in that. And it was so stupid. <laughs> I mean, that water was really pungent. But <laughs> we'd jump in and it, it'd be, you had to not watch it because there'd be pieces of metal in there and all kinds of junk, but uh, I guess they used to irrigate their crops. And they had beautiful crops. They had, uh, well, vegetables and stuff like that. But they grew a lot of sweet peas, so it was nice to walk through there and the birds would be chirping and, and you see this huge array of, of color and flowers and everything. It was very nice. And then we used to go over on uh, Hawthorne, no, 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 on um, Inglewood Avenue and Rosecrans where they've got a shopping center in there, or did, well, they still do. And that was all oil derricks and so forth. And they were 
old even then. And we'd climb those darn things. And the, the ladders would, you know, sway out because they were so old and nails were coming loose and everything. But stupid kids, we were, we'd enjoy it, you know. Could have killed ourselves. But, uh, and that's about it. We, uh, and just bumming around, you know, just going around. And uh, I remember, and they uh, got a little older. It was great sport to go out and, and swipe uh, watermelons or grapes. Like, a fellow had a grape, grape arbor, arbor behind us. It was on Hawthorne and um, near Hawthorne and, and Compton, uh, Marine now. And would go in there and swipe his grapes, and he'd get mad at us and chase us away. And then later on, they raised, raised a lot of uh, watermelons, small watermelons, down in South Lawndale, around 160th something. And we'd go down and swipe those. So it was probably swiping was a bigger thrill than uh, eating the things. That's kid stuff. Sounds like great fun. Yeah. Did you, were you involved in any kind of sports at, uh, back in uh, your childhood? Not really. Um, I, I got hit by a car in, in 1938, which messed me up pretty bad. And it took a long, long time to overcome that. So uh, it really wasn't. Although I, I played, I guess, a little football for Lawndale Central. Um, and that would have been about 1939, 40, somewhere in 40, 40, 41. But it was nothing of consequence. What position did you play? God, it was some line position. I, I only remember two games. First game, we won handily, and we played some school down by Artesia and Aviation. And uh, boy, we're on a roll. So we're, we're gonna, so the next game was against a Hermosa school on Pier Avenue, and they they really waxed us. <laughs> but those are the only two games that I remember. So where did you go to school? I went to Lawndale Central uh, kindergarten twice. They let me into uh, early kindergarten. I was too young. But my mother was sick, so they, they uh, let me go there unofficially. And then officially I started in 1932, I guess it was. And then I graduated there, and then I went to Losinger High until 44. What were the schools like back then? Oh, boy. Um, a lot of teachers are great, but I think they were getting into progressive education. Some of our teachers were really good, but some of them were, I, I just, in re reflection, like, um, they were getting too progressive in their education and too far away from the three R's and so on, although we had, we had some very good teachers. Um, it was more, we gave the Pledge of Allegiance every every morning before class, and it wasn't, you know, it, it wasn't the uh, end of the world if we had a prayer for somebody. Uh, it was nice, it was a good, the good schools. Okay, so um, you went to Losinger High, and, and uh, back in the day they had one, I guess, Longdale Central was a one through eight, and then you had... Uh, well, there's South School down uh, on the other end. Uh, I was around 170th. I don't know where it was. It was way down there. And the kids there would go up until I think it was the sixth grade, and then they would transfer and finish up in Lawndale. But we who lived in in northern part of Lawndale, we started kindergarten and went straight through. So we just had kindergarten through eighth. And they had kindergarten through six. Okay. Then, uh, okay, then you went to Losinger High. What was, what was it like going to Losinger High back in the day? Oh, <laughs> you'll want to edit this out probably. It was so nice compared to now. I've I've gone back to some of the some of the um, reunions here, and it's very sad to see it. The school. There were no fences. There were no. I mean, you know, no uh, gates around the place. You could walk on and off the campus, anybody, anytime, no problem. No guards in the halls, as now. Um, there was grass, a lot of grass, a lot of lawn, and a lot where it's now asphalt. We used to go out there and sit on the lawn, and you'd eat your lunch, and the good humor man would come up there with his 
ice cream truck and you'd get that and get a pint of ice cream and have that and just sit out there and, and talk. And they would play um, big band music and it would just blare out over the microphone. It was, it was, and of course, big. I don't guess they can't do that today because they, the kind of music that's popular today is, is uh, a little more aggressive, I, I guess. And uh, it was that tended to be more soothing than it was. Although it was, you know, had a lot of bounce to it. But um, it, it was a great school. Okay. Did you play any sports during high school? Yeah, I played a little fo football uh, again. Uh, again, no great consequence. Um, I know somebody who played very well and won all kinds of uh, things there at Lusinger. And, and if you want, you can edit this out. But if you want, I can try to get him uh, as an interview. I don't know if you have time yet or not. Oh, yeah. I mean, anybody who's willing to you know, speak oh, to Oh, okay, us, okay. Because he was all CIF. He, did, he was one of these super players. What was his name? Bob Hayes. Yeah, he, he graduated out of Lawndale Central. He went on to Losinger, and he was, I think, freshman year, he was all CIF and track football and, and uh, baseball. And then he went on to play for, um, God, who was it? Some professional baseball team, and he went to Pepperdine and Humboldt College, played football for them. But uh, I'll, I'll contact him. And, you give me your card or something. Yeah, no I'll do that as soon as we're done. Yeah. Um, so what did what did teenagers do for fun? Oh boy, different times. Well, they had the skating rink over here on uh, 147th and Larch, right in that area. So they'd go skating, and we just we just bum around at night, and you'd, you'd play. Um, as teenagers, though, we would play some games. We're just, you know, I guess like typical teens. Um, go to movies and things like that. You want to go to a movie, you had to go to Hawthorne at the closest. They had the Plaza Theater up there and the, and the Rex. Uh, the Rex they call the Dirty Dime because it, it only cost a dime to get in, but it was pretty sleazy. The Plaza was a little more expensive, but they showed better, better films. And uh, and then you go up and hang out at um, the sweet shop up there by the by the Plaza Theater in Hawthorne. So a lot of us would go up there usually on Wednesday night, and you'd hang out there, and other kids would show up. Um, that was about it. There, was, there just wasn't a whole lot to do. It was, you had to you had to do for yourself. You had to figure things out, and you know, just get together and, and do things. You didn't have a lot of uh, programmed entertainment. And of course, there's no television. TV didn't come in until about 45 or 40, 46, I think, uh, on a mass level. And a lot of radio. Radio was big entertainment. Everybody loved radio. It was just, just great. In a lot of ways, it's better than TV because it lets your imagination work. A lot of good shows then. Cool. That's great. Now, I know my, my parents were big fans of the radio. <clears throat> oh, good shows. Yeah. February get McGee and Molly and uh, uh, Jack Benny and Bob Hope and, uh, oh, God, so many of them. Enjoyed them. Can you tell us uh, a little bit about the business community in Lawndale? Yeah. Um, let me see. There were three markets, as I remember. The shoes market, which was on 147th and Hawthorne. And then there's a Rico's, which was on Hawthorne and uh, Rosecrans. And Zhao's market, which I went to, but I can't remember where they were, but they were on Hawthorne someplace. And those are about the only markets that I know of. Um, in the 40s, there were two rooming houses. My folks were in one of them. And they had a lot of the military wives stay there because uh, we had a, a detachment of people here, artillery station in Lawndale, and some defense workers. And then there was the Pines, which was on um, 
it was also a rooming house. It was on 147th near Prairie. Um, and then there was Jake's. Broken ours was, or neighbors of ours, and they moved in about early 30s into Lawndale, or next door to us on Hawthorne Boulevard. And like everybody else, they were broke, but he was pretty sharp, and he somehow he bought a car and put it in the backyard and sold the parts. And he found out that was a pretty good way to make, mon make money, so he kept doing it. Got a little bigger, and he, he moved uh, up to the corner of Hawthorne and um, Ro um, Compton, and they put in a gas station there and wrecking yard and, and so on. He did really well because they, they didn't have two nickels to rub together when they first moved in. And by 1937, they were able to buy their first car. And it wasn't shortly after that we were buying a new Packard every year. And they had a couple of yachts and so on. So they really did well. And one of the reasons was that um, during the Depression, people couldn't afford to buy new car parts. So they'd go there for you know, an alternator or even old tires or windshields or anything like that. And then, of course, when the war broke out, then, you know, there was no place else to go. In fact, they said that uh, the war, they didn't make as much money during the war because they had a um, requirement uh, that they had to make scrap out of so much of their stuff. So they'd have to uh, scrap parts that they could have sold and got more money for. Uh, as parts rather than just a scrap, but they did well. But anyhow, they were probably, in my mind, they were probably the biggest uh, business in town. But and that was that was about it. We didn't have a whole lot of business here. The, the um, there's some small, very small, five and dimes on 147th by Hawthorne, across from Shoes, shoe repairs. I think there were three, three or four. Um, feed stores, and a couple of them were on Hawthorne. One was on 147th, one was on Hawthorne, and then, well, two of them were on Hawthorne. Um, but th there was just not a whole lot of business here other than the small business. If you wanted to go shopping for anything like that, like when I'd get school clothes, my mom would take me, we'd go up to Cheney's and Hawthorne, the department stores there up there, or if you really wanted to get stuff, you'd go up to Inglewood because it was a lot more of a metropolis than even Hawthorne. Okay. Um, when did you re when did you start really noticing that Lawndale was growing? You know, I mean, you know, subdivisions of land, people building more houses. When did that start really to accelerate? I don't know, because it really didn't grow that much while we were here. We left just before the war ended, and it really hadn't changed that much in size uh, at that time. Uh, a lot of land, a lot of space, and uh, I don't think it had grown very much, and it hadn't filled in too much. So it's uh, probably like post uh, you know, World War II? Yeah. The yeah. Were coming back from, uh, yeah, that was probably when it when it took off. But while we were, it really didn't, because the wars were still on. There wasn't a whole lot of building or anything uh, during the depression. Things were pretty bad. I know we had a lady nearby, and at the time we were we had hogs. We had about a hundred hogs that we were raising on our place, and it was on large by uh, 147th again. And we were feeding day-old bread. My, my folks had some kind of a deal where they were getting from the bakeries. They, they could pick up this day-old bread and pies and cakes and stuff, and they feed it to the hogs. And it's about that time we learned that there was some lady not very far away, a couple, two, three blocks away, and she'd starved to death. And it turned out she just was too proud to ask for help. And that <laughs> really made us feel bad that we had, it would would have been any problem at all to you know to help her, but uh, people had a lot of pride then. They just didn't look for a handout. Uh, they got one, and they wanted to work for it. And Interesting. Um, 
So you, you, you moved away uh, right before World War II. Um, right before it ended. Oh, right before it ended? Right, 44. Okay, so then uh, after, you, after you, left, you left Londale, where did you go? Inglewood. Inglewood? And you lived in Inglewood for? For a long time, until 51, I got drafted and went in the Army. So you, you served in the Korean War? Yes. Okay. And I didn't uh, go to Korea, thankfully, but I was in during that time. Okay. And, uh, and then when you came back from Korea, you lived in Inglewood again, or? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, where, and how long did you live in Inglewood? Oh, God. We moved there in 44 till about 50... Fifty-eight, I guess. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. And where did where did you uh, live after Inglewood? <coughs> Excuse me, my wrong pipe. <coughs> I got married at that time, and so we bought a place in Inglewood, <coughs> a little tiny place, and then we sold it and moved to Torrance, what's now Car Carson, and we were there for oh gosh. Uh, to about 1970, and then we moved to Claremont, California, and then came back here and lived in PV. Okay. So, um, your, your, the breadth of your experience in Lawndale is probably up to the end of World War II, correct? Right. Have, have you spent much time in the city, uh, you know, since, uh, since that time? I come back, and of course I had friends, you know, so when we left here, we moved out. I still was coming back. I had a lot of good friends, so I'd come back and, and visit with them. But, uh, yeah, so I, I stayed kind of active in the town. Um, I still come back and, and poke around. So, so how, in, your, in your perspective, how has Lawndale changed from back when you lived here? Uh, to like now, what do, what do you think about the changes that uh, have taken place? I don't place? like them what I see, but I don't like the world that I see, you know. Uh, too crowded. Uh, you had a lot of space then. I mean, I was a little kid and I could just wander any, and I did. I wandered all over this place. And even as a, as a teenager, you'd, you'd hitchhike, you'd go every place, so you didn't worry about anything. And of course now you, you you have to be concerned where you're going, and day or night you just take off and go. There, no worries about getting shot or beat up or anything like that. So it was a lot calmer, nicer place. Um, and I think the people, well, I, I think people are pretty friendly now too. But I think they were more friendly then, and they really tried to help it because everybody was hurting and everybody knew they were hurting. Uh, until the war came along, and in the 1941, uh, 42, things started changing big time because they uh, had defense jobs opening up and everybody's going to work for a, a shipyard or for Northrop or Douglas or one of those places. Um, but, uh, and things did get better for them, but too, was, uh, people were just very nice and they tried to help out. Um, I remember, and my own, of course, they knew me, Gokinars, but I, I was, you know, I was a young guy and I was hurting. And um, I always had junk cars, <laughs> could barely hold them together with bailing wire. And I blew up my engine in my car, and uh, an old Ford. So they had a, a truck there, a V8 truck, and they pulled the engine out of the V8, and they installed it in my car. and. No, no charge for either installing it or, or even for the engine because they knew I didn't have anybody to pay for it anyhow. So it was things like that that they do. Um, it, was, it was a nice place, great place to grow up because you, you could let your kids go and they didn't have to worry and it was just, just very nice. Um, although my brother told me, talking about fighting and stuff like that, that at the um, skating rink, now he's about 13 years older than me, so this would have been the early 30s, that um, guys from Lawndale 
and then guys from Redondo or whatever surrounding towns, they'd show up down there and they'd have fights. <laughs> and they'd form a circle and somebody would jump out of the circle and they'd wail at each other and, until they got tired and then, you know, and then a couple of other guys would jump out and they'd wail at each other. And I guess it was a way of working off the testosterone, I don't know. But uh, it, it was, nobody was really, there was no guns or clubs or anything like, no knives, anything like that. It was just, just good old fashioned fist. Good old fast, yeah, and they'd just bang away and, and nobody got seriously hurt. But uh, they enjoyed themselves. Wow. So um, what did your dad do? Well, he did, I guess, what a lot of our fathers did. He worked nights, and he was a um, stationary engineer and a tool designer. And then he worked days taking, he was always working. He was one of these people he could do anything, uh, repair anything, electrical, plumbing, cars, etc. And so he, he would work around the house and we were, my mother was very um, ambitious. And so she was really the financial spark behind the family. And so she got some animals and so forth and pigs and, and uh, so we had to help build pens and, and do whatever you are around there during the day, but then he'd go work at night too, so. Uh, and then he tried to sleep as best he could a little bit during the day. But like he, during the first part there, he worked for, well, way back, he worked for the WPA. He helped put in um, Alondra Park. That was a WPA project. And then he got a job with um, the YMCA in, in downtown Los Angeles. And uh, he worked there until the war, and then, then he got a better job with uh, Douglas Aircraft as a tool and die maker. And, but. Sorry about that. Sorry. Right. Uh, I should do the last room right there. Oh. So um, um, you had how many brothers? One brother and two sisters, and they were all... One was born in 15, 16, and 17. I was born in 28. Oh, wow. Okay, so, so you, you, you were I was a baby considerably younger than Right, your right. Uh -huh. Two of them are gone, and I still have my one sister. She's 91 now, I guess. Wow. Pretty good shape for 91, though. You talk to her a lot? Yeah, pardon? You talk to her quite a bit? Oh, yeah. Yeah. She grew up here. She... Uh, she went to Lawndale Central when we first moved in here. She went to Lawndale Central in the eighth grade, and then on over to um, uh, Losinger. All three of them went to Losinger. Okay. So, um, did uh, did your uh, siblings uh, help raise you, or were they an influence on your life? They were an influence. But um, I don't know about raising because I, I just <laughs> kind of a weed, you know. Uh, you just grow, and uh, everybody was busy doing what they had to do. Um, but they had an influence. They were, they were good people. You know, they had good moral fiber and all that, and honest and so on. So from that part, they did. Yeah. But. Can you tell us anything about when Lawndale actually became a city, uh, when they incorporated you know, No, that was, I, that was probably after I left here. And I know that, I think they were starting to talk about it uh, in the 40s, in the, in the late 40s. But of course the war was still going on, so that's where the priorities were uh, dealing with that. Um, so I don't know when, when they actually did the incorporation. I vaguely remember them. It was being talked about, though. Okay. So now, I know we're kind of jumping around a little bit here. That's all right. Um, yeah, you, you joined the military uh, during the Korean War, and what, what, what branch of the service were you in? Signal Corps. Signal Corps? And I was very lucky. I stayed stateside. Um, I went to first to Fort Ord, and that was where I got processed. 
There were five of us that got pulled out for single car because of our test results. <coughs> and they sent us to camp, what was in Camp Gordon, Georgia, that's Fort Gordon. And we were there for about 10 months um, and took radio school training. And we knew that one class was, was going to stay stateside. Everything else was going to what they call FECOM, Fire Eastern Command, Korea. Nobody wanted to go there because <laughs> you'd see the pictures come back and it was not good. And uh, so guys were trying to jump ahead and drop back. And I, I got into that for a while and I thought, I'm not saying, I mean, I'm, I'm going to take it as it comes. And I was lucky because our class was one that was state, stateside. And we came to Camp Cook and opened up the signal school there. And then went up to San Luis Obispo and, and around and so on. So I stayed stateside the entire time. Good duty. Yeah, I loved it. <laughs> I hated the Army, but uh, it was a wonderful experience. And like, I guess everybody has gone through it. You know, you wouldn't trade it, but you sure wouldn't would want to go it through it. Right. <laughs> yeah. Once is enough. You avoid it, yeah. I hear you. I was in the Navy myself. Yeah, same thing, I'm sure. Yeah, you know, I, I've got some incredible experience and some incredible stories to tell. But, you know, <laughs> Once I certainly, is enough. I certainly wouldn't want to go back yeah. and join it again, that's for sure. I, uh, my dad was uh, World War II. He was in the uh, 78th Lightning uh, Division. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I don't, you know, some, he just recently kind of opened up a little bit about, you know, some of the things yeah. that, you know, he went through yeah. in the war. And I'm, I'm, I'm amazed by it. He was part of the Battle of the Bulge, uh, you know, coming through and, you know, yeah. France and yeah. through Germany and stuff. And, he talks, you know, about uh, the Remagen Bridge, and you know. Um, you know well, he, he saw it all then. Yeah, yeah. It was pretty amazing. He ended up uh, uh, getting pneumonia, and they had to ship him back stateside. By the time he finally got back, they were already in Berlin. Wow. And then uh, it became regular army, and that's when my dad said, "I'm done with this." Yeah. But you know, he he had got out, uh, retained his commission, and. Uh, and then they ended up calling him back to Korea. My dad goes, oh, my God, you know. He had, to, yeah. he had met my mom, and they were planning on getting married, but, uh, you know, the priest told him, you know, you should wait until you get back from uh, Korea. So uh, they did, and, uh, you know, eventually they got married. And we got the same kind of a track, too. Uh, we, yeah. uh, my parents bought a house in Inglewood, lived in Inglewood till, the, till about the time of the Watts riots. Then we moved uh, to Torrance. Uh, lived in Torrance uh, for quite a while, and then my dad moved up to Palos Verdes, so um, they've been there since like 1970, so almost a, kind of a parallel well, track. Well, I moved there in 1970, 71 actually. Mm -hmm. yeah, he, he, had, he ended up buying a fixer-upper for like $70,000, and we, I was like, I guess about 12, to about from about 12 to 14, and uh, we would go over to the house and just, you know, before he actually even moved in, you know, fixing it up uh -huh. and getting it to a livable condition. And then we worked on it for about another year or two after that, you know, just, you know, trying to make it nice how he wanted it. And, uh, you know, what an incredible investment it ended up turning oh. out to be, you know. Oh, yeah. When I bought my place up there, my wife and I, and, and uh, we bought the thing and we were, you know, just delighted to get in there, and it was a tract. And I'd go over to the tract office, and we paid, I think it was 60 or 65,000 for it. And I'd see the prices were going up, but they were still building places, but they wanted more money for them. I thought, that's strange. Are they putting in more expensive places or what? And the guy said, no, the, the prices are going up. And he says, uh, some of the salespeople here are buying one or two more places. I thought, oh, sure they are, you know. I wished I had them. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, who, who, who would think? Huh. Right? Just the property values here in Lawndale, you know? I mean, just literally, just a couple of years ago, yeah. you could pick up a house here in Lawndale for about a half a million. Yeah. You yeah. Know? And uh, I know that my house in, uh, in uh, Torrance was originally built for $17,000. And, you know, it was, you know, evaluated at the height of the real estate boom, up to about $850,000. Wow. Like, wow, I was amazed, you know. 
Of course, it's not that worth that much now, but... Yeah, oh, no, everything's uh, but, slid uh, back a little bit. Know, I mean, just, you know, in terms of just the real estate, how the home is such a good investment. Yeah. Know? Well, when folks bought a place a lot on large, it was 15003 large, which is just a little bit north of, of um, uh, Compton, Moraine. And they moved a house in there. It was a big two-story. And it was, I guess, um, J uh, Jim Osborne was telling me it belonged to the, um, oh, God, what is it? Some seed uh, family. They raised seeds or sold seeds or something. And the place was out there um, on uh, Marine or Compton by where the reservoir a ditch goes through out there. And they moved it on in, and I think it cost them all together something like three thousand dollars, and that was that was about nineteen thirty nine, probably around there, nineteen thirty nine, maybe forty. And so things started, you know, going up. And uh, I remember my mom was talking to the um, uh, to the uh, guy that held the mortgage on the place. And she said, oh, I was thinking about selling it. And he says, well, what do you want? And she says, oh, I, I don't know. She says, I don't know what properties are worth. And remember, they paid about three for it. And she says, well, you know, maybe 35 for you. I'll give you 5000 right now. And of course, when he said that, and they said it with that, with, uh, that in mind, to let her know that <laughs> you better think about this. Then she just held off and, and held on to it. The place is still there. It's on a uh, large, big two-story house there. Great house. Loved it. Yeah, some of the, some of the old, like, uh, Victorian houses that they still have, you know, in the, in the neighborhoods, those are amazing houses. Oh, yeah. Well, this, this is really a well-built, big house, and um, it was just a charming place. And that's, we had a lot of the military wives and defense workers uh, stayed there with us and it was it was a good place All right. so um, what what do you think the future holds for Mondale? that's a real good question um, I think it's kind of bright I think if uh, with the right direction and everything I think Lawndale has got good geo a good geographic location it's a nice area, good, good in climate and all that. Um, and I see as I drive through here, I see they're trying to keep it beautified. They're keeping the streets looking good, and they got planters going and things like that. Near as I can tell, the crime rates are down. I don't see a whole lot of bars on windows. Um, so uh, I, I think the prospects look good, but of course. <laughs> the whole world doesn't look good right now, but I think the bright spots right now, I think Lawndale has, has got good potential. When we lived here, Englewood was the best place to go. I mean, that was that was it. That was a wonderful place, and Hawthorne was pretty good. But they've both slumped considerably since then, and Lawndale seems to have come up, and hopefully it'll continue to come up. Well, you know, you know the, the old real estate adage, location, location, location. Right. You know, I mean, you know, you figure it's only Lawndale's a couple miles got, from the beach. Right. You've got the clean air that blows right. right. off that right. ocean, you know. Right. And, you know, you, you, could, you could move inland, you know, out to San Bernardino, get a more affordable place, but you got to live in the smog and the heat right. and all that. It's, a, it's positioned pretty well. You know? Oh, it's wonderfully positioned. Yeah, I mean, you can't beat the weather. I, I'm talking to, you know, friends of mine, you know, everybody's, you know, moved all over the place. And this one girl that um, I know for from... Uh, grade school, she lives in Chico now, 106 degrees, yeah. you know, it's like, yeah. she goes, tell me about how beautiful the weather is in the South Bay, Tom, <laughs> <laughs> so I'll let her know, yeah. you know, but yeah, they were 106, and we were, we were about 76, you know. Yeah, no, it's always been great here. I remember when I was a kid, and this was back in the middle 30s, I guess, that, uh, I don't know how often this happened, but it seemed like quite a bit, but maybe not, because kids kind of get things mixed up, but it would rain, and then we'd get puddles of ice out in the yard. We'd have little ditches out there, and they'd get, they'd be, it would form ice. And uh, that was fun, because ice is something we just, 
you know, we didn't know anything about snow and ice except what you saw. And, right. But um, I don't think that happened more than a couple of times. I know it did snow down here one time. I don't think we lived here then, though. That was 40, late 40s, I think. But, uh, yeah, the, the weather is just, you just don't beat it here. It hailed about maybe three months ago. Here. Yeah. Uh, it's got it's got a lot of good benefits. Yeah. Very nice. Well, I tell you, you know, that's pretty much all the questions I have. Um, is there anything that like that we didn't cover that you know you kind of maybe you have in your mind or something that you know you'd like to uh, talk about? Well, you're talking about I don't know. My brother was in. Uh, he was at Pearl Harbor when they did it there. He'd just gone over in about 1940, I think, joined the Navy. He was at Kaneohe Ken Naval Air Base. It's a PBY station, his radio man. And um, so when, when the December 7th hit, you know, we were, there's no word coming out of Hawaii. We had no idea whether hurt, dead, or what. And that lasted for quite a while. I don't know, it seemed like couple of weeks or something because they put a, a freeze on any communications. Uh, only military and government uh, could come out of there. And we'd heard that only next to kin would get the first telegrams and so forth. And I heard this was in that two-story house on, on March. And it has a big glass window, a front door, and uh, it was glass. So my mom could look out and the guy coming up the driveway could look in, and I heard her let out a scream, and she was slumped against the wall like I'm running out, and she was saying, oh, no, oh, God, no, oh, no, and this telegram guy was coming up to our house, and I, a telegram guy, he could see her too, and he said, no, no, lady, it's good news, it's good news, lady, it's good news, and so we got the telegram, and it was from my brother, and it just says, uh, Okay, letter follows, and that was it. That's all they could say because they were restricted. Had so many people were trying to get word out, um, but that was a big moment. Um, oh, you asked about businesses. Uh, the other business here was Peterson's Dairy, um, which is on Compton by I don't remember the other street, two three blocks east of Hawthorne. And they served, you know, I think they were the only dairy that I remember, but they provided most of the milk around here unless you went to the market. And then there was a um, pottery factory over on, uh, oh, about three or four blocks west of Hawthorne, about 150th, somewhere in there. And I worked there for a while, and uh, mixing the mud for them, and they'd make their stuff and they'd carry it into the kiln. And they the metlock, right? Yeah, yeah, that was it. Yeah, I think that was it. And uh, they were pretty good. It was a nice place. What kind of stuff did they make? Hard work. Pardon? What kind of stuff did they make? I remember they made a lot of these little ashtrays, and then they would make bowls and stuff like that, and ceramic cups and so forth. And I didn't work there very long. I was just 15 years old, and it must have been winter time because I remember it was cold as hell outside. The rain was coming down, and then I'd carry the mud inside this place, and it was just really. Oh, and then I'd have to carry the stuff into the uh, kiln where it was very, very hot, and that's where they dry it out. I don't know why I didn't die. <laughs> You're going from real cold to real hot. But. Uh, And then up the street here, you got a place, um, the Hearns, they put it in. You got an alley behind you here, or I guess it's behind us. And uh, uh, the Hearns, uh, Mr. Hearn, he was a studio carpenter, and he built their house. And they, um, it doesn't have any, it's just a dirt floor. I guess that's what they did in Europe. But that house is still there. I don't think anybody lives in it now. Uh, I think, I don't know the Hearn family or what, they put a place on, on front, on, was Buren? And, uh, 
but the house is still there. I don't think it's lived in at all. But I don't know, it seems like it's a, some Lawndale, I don't know, I guess they can't do stuff like that, but it's so old that uh, that's what it's doing. Oh, and then I remember a friend of mine, they lived on around 152nd and then Fermona in that area. And they didn't have indoor plumbing. They just had an outhouse. Now, most people in Lawndale at that day, time had plumbing. But I guess when you got out that far, or at least in that area, they didn't have it. I don't know why not. But they were the only ones that I remember that didn't have uh, indoor plumbing. So, which is not good. <laughs> you guys, did you guys have incinerators? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I don't know why the town didn't burn down, because I remember we'd have, you'd go out there with the incinerator, and if you didn't close it up, all the papers and stuff would be floating around on fire. But no, I, I guess it, it burned out real fast, and, and most people closed the incinerator up pretty good anyhow, so you didn't have to worry about that. But yeah, it was kind of a drag when they made you get rid of them, because then you had to start packaging your your trash to get rid of it, where it's easier to just take it out and put it in the incinerator and light it on fire and let it go. We had one in the, in the backyard of our house in uh, Inglewood. And, um, you know, I vaguely remember the story, but my mom always you know, trots it out when we're talking about, you know, me growing up. But apparently I tried to stick a cat in the incinerator one time. <laughs> Not good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, so.